to you. It's an important one. Um, equally as important as the other uh, classes that you sat through today. And thank you all so much for volunteering your time to come in today. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to carry me and the kids from Northbrook around on our, well, our, our Christmas carol. Well, Christmas carol. Yeah, see? Just a little perspective there. Now you know who I am. <laughs> or what I do, anyway. Um, so we've got a lot to cover, and uh, this is important. Um, my name is Joe Sabori. I'm a sworn deputy sheriff with the chief analyst out at the sheriff's office here in Queens County. Um, I'm a retired Maryland State Trooper. I was a commander of our Homeland Security and Intelligence Section when I was with the State Police. And um, I thought you were saying, I'm sorry, you were with the State Police. <laughs> 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 I thought you were saying, I'm sorry, you were with the State Police. That had been a long time ago. Um, but one of the things that I was passionate about and assigned to was these types of uh, threats against our country. Um, I want to say before we go any further that I have a nine-year-old and 11-year-old. Miss Sue Green drove him around for a while. Uh, and I, no one has more admiration for you uh, than me because you guys have a, you do an amazing job at what you do. Miss Sue uh, and Mr. Dean can tell you that if there's any problems with any of my kids, nine and 11 years old on the school buses. They both have my cell number and can call me anytime that they need me for me to straighten their little tails out, okay? I know I've been on field trips with, uh, with my kids uh, and I always wondered what it was like to be in a Metallica concert in a miniature submarine. <laughs> and I figured it out the first time that I went on a trip on the Sultana on a school bus. It was like a 30 minute ride and it was like being shot out of a cannon. So I admire you all for what you do. Would you mind closing that door back there, sir, please? Uh, I admire what you do. I appreciate what you do. Uh, and, and I would never judge. You guys have a, a, a tough job and you do a great job at it. All right, we'll get started. So we got a lot to talk about in a short amount of time. So I'm gonna go very fast. If you have questions, please just raise your hands and we'll have a discussion. Um, our country has uh, been through a lot over the last week as it relates to or pertains to uh, attacks on innocent people. There was a shooting, uh, there's been three shootings nationally, <coughs> active shooter attacks within a four day period in Texas, California, and Ohio. Okay. Uh, these types of things are not going to go away. We've got to get ourselves right, we've got to get our minds right, we have to have the right mindset. Uh, to do a better job at reporting these types of things before they stop. Every public school, every private school in our nation has received some training in run, hide, fight. When the assailant comes in, we want to barricade the door, we want to hide behind desks, we want to, everybody knows how to do that, right? The one, the shift now is identifying pre-attack indicators. And when I say pre-attack indicators, that means stopping these types of things before they happen. That's where the focus is. Because we gotta get tired of saying, I never thought it could happen here. You can only say that so many times. It's time to stop saying that and start doing things to stop these types of attacks from happening. First cat, love it. Good stuff, I'm an army guy too. All right, I'm gonna skip over a couple slides just to make sure that we can have a good conversation. But this is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about Lessons learned from history, what to do, how to detect and report unusual activity, uh, behaviors that we can look for, influences that contribute to these types of attacks, profiles of an assailant, protect and I defend on your school bus. Some of the topics we're going to talk about might be a little bit intense, but they're conversations again that we need to have. When I do these presentations, and I've taught thousands and thousands of police officers and civilians over the course of my law enforcement career, I can always look around the room, and I always end up within the first 30 seconds meeting eye contact with somebody who I look at, and I can see in their eyes, they're sitting in the back of the room, and they're saying with their eyes, this has nothing to do with me. Why am I sitting here? How many people in here go to the movies? Raise your hand. You go out to dinner? You go to the mall? You go to a concert? You go to church? 
You go to a Walmart. This has to do with you. This has to do with you. So maybe what I'm talking about might not apply to what goes on on your school bus, but you got a life outside of that, do you not? Yeah. Okay. So these types of things apply there also. Here's what we know: the types of attacks aren't going to stop. There's no way to fully stop them from happening. This is how I live my life. I plan for nothing, but I prepare for everything. Plan for nothing. Be prepared for anything. I'm a 9 and 11 year old. I have to be prepared for <laughs> anything. It has changed the way that law enforcement and EMS respond to these types of attacks. As these things continue to happen, law enforcement and EMS, we learn from them and we grow and we change the way that we respond and we change our tactics. But I'll tell you what, so are these assailants because they're, they're doing their research and just, just like we are. Learn from historical events. Teach, train, and learn. That's why we're here today. Make no assumptions. Observe and report. I'll go through these pretty quick. We've got to adapt and stay ahead. Lessons learned from history. We're going to do a couple quick case studies. Try not to fall asleep in here on me too, right? This is super important. I had that same gourmet lunch that you guys had, right? <laughs> and I know it's just like soaking into my body. You know, it was so delicious. That sub is like sitting right here. All right, but hang with me, all right? We got, this is the last one of the day for me anyway. All right, I'm gonna give you everything I got. Okay. All right. You go, Joe. All right, I'm bringing it. I'm gonna bring it. All right, uh, Joyce Gregory was a very well-liked, well-respected uh, school bus operator in Dover, Tennessee. She was fairly new with the school system and only been driving the school bus for two years before she was fatally shot by a 14 year old on her bus. Mm -hmm. Well known, well liked, and highly respected, there are 24 kids on the bus between the ages of 5 and 17. It's pretty much what you guys mm -hmm. all around, right? Mm -hmm. She and the gunman had been involved in an argument the previous day. That never happens, right? You will mm -hmm. never get into disagreements or you tell a kid, nope, you're not sitting back there anymore. You're right up here beside me, mm -hmm. okay? Doesn't make them happy. She was involved in an argument. I don't know what the argument was the previous day. I can tell you that the school official said we got the stark realization that it could happen here. We've learned a lot. We take things seriously. Why does it take something tragic before we say to ourselves, we've got to make a change? Exactly. It's part of the reason why we're here today. Right? We've got to prepare ourselves for these types of things. We can't keep sitting back and feeling sorry and remorse and thoughts and prayers and think about the communities and the ripple effect. Right? We've got to start thinking about prevention, identification, pre-attack indicators, responding, reacting, and reporting. Stop this stuff before it happens. 2018 in Easton, Pennsylvania, this 26-year-old gal, uh, she made it into Easton Middle School in Pennsylvania, completely undetected, unchallenged, undetected. She walks in, found Friday morning, she was eating breakfast in the cafeteria with other kids. May have had mental health issues, uh, <laughs> probably. School district says the woman told them that she thought she was 13 years old. Appearance-wise, she was very much would have been able to pass for a teenager. Rode a school bus to the middle school and got off with the other students. Oh. Wow. Is it uncommon for you to arrive at a bus stop, say maybe midway through the school season, and a kid that doesn't typically get on your school bus is there to get on your school bus? No. That happens, right? Yeah. It does happen. And I know it upsets you guys because You've never been notified that this kid's supposed to be getting on your bus. And you can't seem to get a straight answer out of anybody on why this kid is getting on your school bus. I understand that. And uh, Mary Ellen, is it Mary Ellen? Margaret. Margaret. Margaret Ellen sat in when we had that conversation. And I think uh, there's going to be some work towards resolving any types of issues, right? We want to help to make things better. Okay, we want everybody to be on the same page. We, we, that's where we have to be. Okay. But you have to think about when you go to that, when you pull up to that bus stop and you see maybe a student, uh, maybe asking them, who are you? Uh, what's your name? 
What's your family's name? What school do you go to? What grade are you in? Mm -hmm. Kind of find out what they're all about before, before we get them situated on the bus, right? Maybe. Jimmy Lee Dykes, this is a very terrifying case. This made national news. This was in 2013. There again. Hey folks, I don't, I don't just type that in there. That's a caption from a news report. What's it say? It says, it was something that should have never happened in a town like Midland City, Alabama. Not supposed to happen anywhere. We gotta do things to prevent these types of things from happening anywhere. Jimmy Lee Dykes, uh, on the afternoon of January 29, 2013, he approached a Dale County school bus. School bus was just like a sunny afternoon, right? Dropping kids off, he makes his bus stop, he pulls up to the bus stop, and he sees Jimmy Lee Dykes. Never seen him before. Jimmy Lee Dykes didn't know anybody on that school bus. Didn't have a kid on that bus. No relatives on the bus. Never met the bus driver before. Bus driver pulls up, stops, opens the door. Can I help you, sir? Jimmy Lee Dykes says, yep, I want two boys off your bus. One six years old and one eight year old. Bus driver says, realizes now that this is gonna be a problem. He says, no, that's not gonna happen. He pulls the bus door shut. Jimmy Lee Dykes gets a little bit agitated and he actually forces his way onto the bus. Forces his way through the doors and onto the bus. The bus driver, who's a fairly big man, Jimmy Lee Dykes, not a very big man, actually blocks him from going down the aisle, physically restrains him from going down and snatching two kids off that bus, like most of us in here would do. Jimmy Lee Dykes pulls out a firearm and fatally shoots him and kidnaps a five-year-old child off the bus. He takes him into, uh, just down the street, to his property where he has an underground bunker built. Jimmy Lee Dykes had some mental health issues, apparently. Fled to the property, uh, the 15 year old on the bus, listen to this, 15 year old on the bus was the first to call 911. That kid was smart enough when he saw Mr. Poland and Mr. Dykes wrestling around before the, the gunshot was fired, that kid was smart enough to get his phone out and call 911. That's a, that's a resource that many of us in this room didn't have when we were riding the school bus because we didn't have cell phones back then, okay? You got your hands full where you're focusing in on the, the other video of the guy that's riding on the front of the school bus that's slamming on the front of the school bus saying, stop the bus, stop the bus. You don't have time to pull that bus over to get your phone out. Use one of those kids that might be sitting behind you that has that cell phone to call 911 for you while you're dealing with what's going on in front of you. There's two kids in Queen Anne's County that will not be able to help you with that though. And both their last names are Sabori, because my kids won't have cell phones till they're 18. So don't rely on them, all right? Do not rely on them. They will graduate and have jobs before they have cell phones. I'm going to look in the camera. No phones for you kids, okay? All right, so don't turn to them. Don't turn to them. They won't be able to help you. They know how to use a police radio, though. Yes, so they do. If you're radio on the bus, they can yes. use it. All right. Had a standoff with them. They feared that the child was in... Uh, a bad way, so they actually breached the bunker, and uh, Mr. Dykes was uh, incapacitated. No pre-existing relationship with the bus driver or any children on the bus. Now, you're making your bus routes at the end of the day. It's a Friday. Everybody's kids are really that Metallica camp concert's really turned up because it's Friday. And as you approach a bus stop, you see a Jimmy Lee Dyke standing there. You've got to ask yourself, and this is part of your preparation when you leave here to start this new school year, are you going to stop your bus? I don't know. Are you going to stop the bus and open the door and say, can I help you, sir? Mm -hmm. Are you going to keep going maybe another <coughs> block down and then get those kids off the bus so that guy can't come up? Are you going to keep driving and risk someone calling in a complaint on you because you didn't stop at the appropriate bus stop? Don't have to complain. Correct. Exactly. In my world, you complain and it's all going to work itself out because I was acting in good faith to keep these kids and myself safe. These are types of questions that you have to be prepared to answer. Okay? And we can't wait until it shouldn't have happened here. What to look for? There's no one-stop shop. There's no one single demographic.
could be unstable or troubled emotional state, anger or depression, violent behavior, could be a kid that's bullied or teased. I'm not saying that all, look, there's been, active, there's been active shooters, there's been murderers that have come into school that have been popular kids. There was one out west, he was the prom king, high school football quarterback, right, had the whole world and, and committed an act like that, right? So don't think it's the goth kid all dressed in black who's depressed and teased and bullied and things like that, because that's not always the case, folks. It has no face. It has no face. These are symptoms, what to look for. Substance use or abuse, preoccupation with violent media, difficulty coping with life events. I'll just cruise through them. Preoccupation with weapons. Uh, rejection takes to fixation. The, uh, the kid, there's no, you know, I've done the studies, I've read the studies, I've sat through the conferences, I've done my research. I can't tell you that the next active assailant, uh, his mother was a drug user, his father was an alcoholic, they divorced when he was five, his sister committed suicide when he was six years old, and they never bought him the go-kart that he wanted for his birthday, right? There is nothing like that, I'm sorry. It's frustrating for me as a longtime investigator. It's frustrating because we can't put a face on it. We can't say that is going to be our next active assailant. These are just, these are things that are, are commonly associated in those types of uh, occurrences though. Staggering fact, last statistic right there. That number is actually 82. This is a statistic that was released by the United States Secret Service last year in July. That number is 82% now. 82% of the time, this is specifically for school shooters, 82% of the time, someone, a friend, an associate, someone on a sports team, someone on the chess club, whatever, 82% of the time, somebody knew for weeks or months or sometimes even up to a year that a person was planning and preparing to carry out an attack. And you know what they did? Not a darn thing. It's what we're missing. That's why these attacks are happening. That's why the national shift is now moving towards pre-attack indicators. We've got to do a better job at reporting these types of things. 82%. Well, I didn't want to get him in trouble. I didn't feel like it was my place. Well, I would have said something, but nobody would have done anything anyway. That's not your job. You see something going on? Well, I've tried to report stuff before and nobody does anything. It ain't like the school's gonna do anything. Get it out of your hands, folks. Get it out of your hands. Put it on somebody else. Hand it off to somebody else. You've done your due diligence by reporting what you need to report and you can sleep sound at night. Um, so you just have to be actively listening, pretty much. You know, what if they say, oh, they like, playing with guns or I'm going to shoot you. Even the little babies, mm -hmm. you know, they, you don't know whether or not to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Seriously, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm, I do. Let me say this. Uh, every one of you in here has a relationship with those children on your bus. You know the kids, your little confidential informants. The kids that come and talk to you and tell you everything. Sometimes you wish that you could unhear some of the stuff that they tell you. It's not too much. Uh -uh. Nope. You know the ones I'm talking about. They're going to talk to you. You know the ones when they talk about sports or they talk about this or they talk about that. And then you know when it's unusual for them to start talking about something like guns or something like death or something like mass killings or, or things like that. you got to look for those types of indicators. If you're hearing something come from a kid that you normally don't hear coming from them, that's a pretty good sign. We need to let somebody know about that. And I'll tell you, Sheriff Hoffman, I've seen it. We get a call that a kid's going to bring a gun to school. I don't care what time it is, he will call deputies out of bed and they will go down at that parent's house at 2 o'clock in the morning, knocking on their door and interviewing the kid with their parents and seize any guns that are in that house. I've seen it happen. We don't joke around with it. Okay. Use those little confidential informants to your advantage. Be good investigators. You see a bunch of kids hovering over a book bag, you got a kid with a phone out that's maybe scrolling through some pictures of Columbine, and you got four or five kids that are hovering around. Once everybody's off the bus, ask that little informant that you have, hey, 
What was everybody looking at on that phone back there? Mm -hmm. oh, little Johnny was showing us pictures of what? Okay. Of some kid that sh shot up a school. Okay, thank you. Here's your dumb dumb lollipop, right? Mm -hmm. Feed the machine. You always give them something, right? Mm -hmm. Keep them happy. You gotta react to that. The one common denominator that I will tell you, the one shared thing, I told you it's not somebody that's a goth kid or a country kid or whatever walk through life that they're walking through. But I can tell you one thing, and this is an absolute fact. Over the last 20 years since Columbine, the one common denominator in over 90% of school shooters is an infatuation with Claybold and Harris, who were the murderers that carried out the shooting at Colin Columbine, Colorado. So when you're doing your walkthroughs at the end of your bus route, your post post route inspections, and you're looking for kids to make sure everybody got off the bus, and you're looking to make sure nobody tore up your seats, cut your seats up or anything like that, or, or marked them up, and you're walking, promise me this, when you're walking through there and, and picking up that trash, because they're all a little sloppy sometimes, right? They, they don't leave trash on your buses, though, ever, do they? Yeah, <laughs> like bags of trash. Look, promise me this, when you're bending down and you're picking up or sweeping up, into that dustpan, those pieces of paper, is crumbled up, balled up piece of paper. Promise me that you'll take a second to open them up. Because if you unravel one of those pieces of paper and it says how to become, how to beat Clay Bolden Harris's body count at, at Columbine, you better hang on to that piece of paper and call the police. Because we need to go down there and have a talk with that kid. That's the one thing that's shared with those kids is that they are infatuated with the Columbine. To them, that is the OG, that is the grandfather of all mass attacks. They idolize those attacks. I don't want to go too far off topic here, but I've done some work in my past where I've gone on to what we call the dark web, and I've posed as a teenager, and I've been in chat rooms where other kids from all over the world will actually go on there and talk about how they're going to try to beat the body count at Parkland, or the body count at uh, Major Redundant High School, okay? Or the, the body count at, at Columbine. These conversations happen all the time. Yep. We gotta be mindful of that. We've gotta look for those types of things. We have to do a better job at identifying these pre-attack indicators. Everybody with me? All right, hang loose. I know those little cookies are working on us now. Yeah. 2013, 12-year-old male student took a handgun to middle school. He killed two students, and he killed his teacher before he killed himself. In the, how long? Months. Leading up to the attack, the student conducted numerous internet searches for violent material and content, including top 10 evil children, Super Columbine Massacre role-playing game, shoot, guns, bullets, revenge, murder, school shootings, and violent game. Searched for music videos and songs about school shootings, on his cell phone, he kept pictures, saved photos of violent war scenes, and images of Columbine High School shooters, Clay Bolden Harris. He also liked to play first-person shooter games on the computer. Months he spent planning. Twelve years old. My kids, nine and eleven years old, they don't walk into another room without me knowing what they're up to. How do we miss this? A twelve-year-old child researching these types of things on a home and a school computer. We're missing things, folks. Or we're seeing them, and we're just not reporting them. And that makes us part of that 82%. It's happening. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got a question. I got a bunch of uh, elementary kids that talk about Fortnite all the time. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me what Fortnite is? No, oh, really. Uh, I should have my son come in and do that. Because we'd be here for about six hours. Uh, Fortnite is a... Um, is it a killing game? It, it is, but it's a kind of a non-graphic version of like a Call of Duty uh, or some of the more more graphic types of games. Um, so, I mean, there's a scale of ratings and Fortnite is a more uh, dialed down version of a shooting game. Kind of like... A cowboys and Indians type of game without the blood. But I, with I tell them I don't want to hear about it. Yeah, yeah. I say the same thing to my kid. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> what I do, it's funny, this actually happens. 
Um, when I get like a telemarketer call, and, or a number that I don't recognize, and it's somebody trying to sell me some insurance or something stupid like that, the phone will ring, and my kids fight for this now. I'll actually answer, put the answer on it, and then I'll hand it to my phone, and I'll say, I'll hand it to my son, and I'll say, tell him about Fortnite. <laughs> and he will literally start telling this telemarketer all about Fortnite. It's hilarious, because the conversation lasts about 15 seconds, and you'll go, oh, they hung up. <laughs> yeah. My kids actually fight over that. Well, let me get this one. Is that, is that a telemarketer? Do you recognize the number, Dad? And I'm like, yes, it's your grandmother. Get away. <laughs> Some of those games are pretty graphic. Tell your grandmother about Fortnite. <laughs> they are. They are. Yep. I agree. All right. Good question. Keep moving. Anybody know who Gerald Herbert Smith is? Can't happen here. Can't happen here. Won't happen here. At the warehouse? Yeah. So. yeah the warehouse. Herbert. Yeah. George, or Gerald Herbert Smith III. He's uh, 56, probably 57 now, from, uh, used to live around Bridgeley. Former Baltimore City Police Officer, former Anne Arundel County Police Officer. Is that the guy who left the um, truck over at the warehouse? Yes, yeah, he was actually an applicant to be a school bus driver for Billy Willis. In fact, uh, he had met with Billy Willis. I think Billy had even taken him on a route or something like that. One of the gals, two classes ahead of yours, actually went to go get her CDL license with him. And she had an opinion of him that I can't share because Jeff's back there filming. Um, reported as a suspicious person near the Queen Anne's County High School on September 6, 2017. He was reported by, get this, this is gonna blow your mind because nothing is unusual to a teenager. He was reported by a high, teenage high school student. Mm -hmm. Which blows my mind because to them, like the sky could be falling and they'd be like on their phones, what? Uh, you know, like <laughs> nothing faces them. But this kid saw this guy standing outside of his truck smoking a cigarette across from the warehouse, which was unusual to her. She reacted to and responded to something unusual. Sorry, I'll have my back at you for that, for that long. She, and that's great. That's where we need to be. How many people drive their own vehicles here today? If you, while you were driving your own vehicle here today, if it started making a clanking sound and a grinding sound and it sounded like the engine was about to blow up, would that be unusual to you? Oh, yeah. Would you continue to drive it? No. Probably pull over and call somebody, am I right? You get home from this amazing presentation that I'm doing for you today uh, and you, enter, you go into your house and you have this overwhelming smell of propane that just knocks you off your feet. You just gonna keep on going in and maybe light the wood stove? <laughs> is that unusual to you? Yes. It is. Are you gonna react to it? Yes. It's no different than somebody like this. We've gotta do a better job at reacting to and responding to and reporting the unusual or the suspicious. We can't just keep assuming it. We can't just keep waiting for something to happen. He was detained and eventually arrested. And this is what was found in the back of his truck. A big jug of gasoline. I don't know what was in these milk jugs, but it wasn't milk. These are uh, swords, samurai swords, and a gigantic machete. Long knives, three sets of brass knuckles. That's called a PR24 nightstick. Uh, nunchucks. More long sticks there. Another PR24. Two PR24s. A bunch of more hunting knives and things like that. That is a box of ammunition for a rifle. No rifle was recovered. No firearms were recovered in his truck or at his residence. I don't know what he was doing there. But I can tell you what, when I first learned about this case, you know the first person I thought of? Jimmy Lee Dykes from Alabama. Breadcrumbs. We're going to get through these. That's kind of that drawing that I was talking about. We've got a good, good groove going here now. You guys are with me. Language and body language. We gotta look for that. If I am off duty, I'm usually armed. Didn't always be that way. It wasn't always that way. 25 years ago, I would leave the house. I didn't need to be armed. But I have a family now. If I go to the movies, I want to be sure that my family's protected. When I go out, I'm armed. If I happen to be walking downtown Annapolis with my family and I'm armed, and maybe I'm wearing a, a jacket and a pair of slacks, I don't want, as I'm walking, the wind to be blowing, 
and my jacket blow open and people see a very large caliber firearm on my side because it might startle some people, freak some people out. So when you were to see me walk, you may see me walk like this. A little bit of body language. What am I doing by doing that? I'm hiding, I'm concealing, I'm keeping my jacket from blowing open. You pull up to your bus stop this summer, late summer, it's still 90 degrees out, and as you pull up, there's a man, there's a student, either one, that's at the bus stop and they're wearing a long black trench coat. And as they approach the bus, you see them walking like this. Whoa. Yeah. What could they be doing? What could they be do carrying? A long, long gun. Concealing a long gun. Body language and appearance. We have to look for those types of things. Body language. Uh, my nine-year-old, my daughter, uh, she's, she's a little pistol. Okay? <laughs> things don't go her way. Does not take me, as Sue can tell you, uh, doesn't take her, she's not real, tri she's very, very transparent when it comes to things not going her way because she'll do one of these, mm -hmm. cock that head to the side, maybe roll her eyes. She knows to be in the other room from me when she does that because if I, she's in arm's reach, she's mine, okay? Mm -hmm. But still, she shows me some body language, right? We gotta look for that. We gotta look for that type of body language. Change personality, change in appearance. Guys, I'd love to do a time-lapse video, pull the video from the inside of your bus and do a year-long, a school, school year-long video of, and play it and fast forward of the insides of your school buses. To look at, and you can put it on Discovery Channel, it's like these pods of wild <laughs> children, okay? How they migrate to each other and how certain pods form, and they form at the front of the bus and they go to the middle, to the front, all the way to the back, and then that pod breaks up because something happens yep. and a new pod is born. Right? And then they at the front of the bus and the back of the bus. Right? It would be incredible. But they do that, right? They form up. They form up these bonds. Okay? We've got to look at and kind of keep our ear on and our eye on these different pods and these feuds. And talk to that informant that you have to find out, you know, to kind of keep your finger on what's going on. Uh, I used to make people do the YMCA dance when they did that. <laughs> Take it easy on you. Right. Notes, journals, planners, and drawings talk about that. Pictures or photographs. Sites visited on school computers, home computers. Fascination with weapons, bombs, killings, and death. What's an active assailant look like? You and me. Yeah. Like anybody, right? There is no face. That's what an active assailant looks like. We don't know. We don't know. Mm hmm. No physical demographic. There are, there are some common denominators, and I've talked about a couple of them. Most of the time, they have a pathway of violence from a real or perceived grievance. A real or perceived grievance. A real or imaginary beef. Could be domestic related. May kill family members before initiating mass attack. These are all common denominators. With most, a very high 90 percentage of school shootings over the last 20 years. They may have a quest for status. We've talked about that in these dark web chat rooms. Body counts. Affection towards violence. Envious and worship historical violent acts. Hitler. The Columbine shooters. Obsession with weapons or bombs, interest in harm, death, or torture of people or animals. They may act alone. Typically, they do act alone. Since Columbine, there's only been uh, two attacks on schools in the last 20 years where there's been more than one shooter. Usually a public place, usually during the day, they are an injustice collector. Anybody want to take a shot at that one? Injustice collector. Nobody? Nobody likes them. Yep. Everybody yeah, them. absolutely. Everything's against them. Everything's an injustice. The whole world's against me. Resentful of real or imagined rejection. And as we've seen over the last week, uh, a large percentage of these attacks are starting outside of a target area and they're working their way in. All right, so if there was a heaven forbid, an attack on this school, uh, there's a high probability that the attack would actually start out in the parking lot and work its way to the interior of the building. 
All right, we're almost done. Of course, the last two, and even we learned from last weekend, mm -hmm. both of those guys <laughs> actually went into the facility, mm -hmm. scoped it out, yep. and then they went back out and decided, okay, it's ready for the picking, and yep. they did the Walmart that's, and, and yep. that other date shooting, which is something that... That's new. That's new. That mm -hmm. They hadn't pre-screened, but... I talk, and that's, that's excellent. I'm glad you brought that up. Because I said, you know, as law enforcement and EMS, we change our tactics and change the way that we react to these types of things, so do these assailants. Um, in Parkland High School, uh, the shooter down there, Nicholas Cruz, he did something that had never been done before in a school attack. Uh, he knew after being in and out of high school, kicked in and out of high school, he knew that when there's a fire alarm drill, when the fire alarm goes off, what do the students do? They run. They get up and they, they don't run, but what do they do? They get up and they go outside, right? So you know what the first thing he did when he entered the school, when he breached the school? He pulled the fire alarm. That had never been done before. He did that because he wanted higher numbers of people out in the hallway. He knew that once the first round started to be fired, people were gonna barricade or run, hide, or fight. But he knew that he could increase his odds and for the first time, we saw a shooter actually go into school and pull that fire alarm to get those kids out into that fatal final out to the hallway. So you're right. It's evolving. We've got to change with it. We've got to do a better job as society at, at stopping these things before they happen. We've got to react and respond. We go through these real quick. Be aware of your environment. No matter where you are, folks, take this with you. If you don't take anything else with you, I just want you to be more aware of your environment, no matter where you are. How many of you guys actually, how many have children or grandchildren? Okay. How many of you guys have ever been to the beach? All right, you go to the beach, you set up, right? You're aware of things, especially if you got your kids with you. You're getting your sunscreen on them, you're picking out a spot in the beach, you're looking for a little shade, nice and wide open, right? You're watching the kids in the water, stuff like that. I'm really watching for sharks, right? Everybody else is like, I'm the one looking out for sharks. But you are, you're hyper-vigilant, right? You're watching and, you're, and you're, you're super aware of your surroundings. You're sitting there, you can't take your eyes off, off the kids because you don't want to get hit by a wave or stuff like that, right? Nothing changes. We have to be, we just have to continue at a, at a high level of awareness. Be aware of unusual sight, sounds, and actions. Uh, disruptions in routine, what was normal is no longer normal. Uh, suspicious activity on the bus, bus stops, vehicles following the bus after the, uh, at the school, or vehicles parked at the schools. All right. Has everyone seen this video? Has anyone not seen this video? I've seen that. Anyone not seen it? All right, I'm going to play a couple minutes of it. Jack, that looks like you. here, right? Where did that happen? Oh, 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 oh. Pretty close. Hey, I get where this guy was coming from. He's a retired school teacher. School bus is driving down the street. Some punk teenager in the back of the bus decides to wing a full Gatorade bottle at him and strikes him as he's standing there on the side of the road. I don't think anybody in here would turn around and go, oh, that was so funny. We'd be pissed, would we not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe he didn't necessarily, you know, go the right way on that. <laughs> okay, things went a little bit south. But still, he was upset and you can see that. I credit the bus operator in this video because it was incredibly, other than the one kid that screamed, oh my God, it was pretty darn quiet on that bus, wasn't it? I don't know whether they turned around and said everybody be quiet or what, what the situation was, but everybody was fairly quiet on that bus. That's a great opportunity as you're dealing with a crisis like that that is exterior of the bus and your eyes are exterior of the bus, that's where you want to use those kids on the bus, except for the two support kids, to dial 911 for you, okay? 
use that as an opportunity because your focus is, is, is now at the front of the bus. All right, a couple of options here, use your bus radio or those cell phones we talked about. Uh, do your best to deny an assailant entry onto the bus. If the threat is outside of the bus, we want to keep the threat outside of the bus. Think about how you do that. Close the door, keep driving. Uh, obviously, if your bus is moving fairly quickly, there's very few people that are going to be able to grab a hold of and, and get onto your bus while it's in operation. Use strong verbal commands to deter the intruder. Direct students to escape through other exits. Use that kid on there to dial 911. You got somebody hanging onto the front of your bus, beating on the hood, that's a good time for you to put those red flashers on, have one of the kids get on 911, tell them who they are, what bus they're on, where you're headed, where you are, what's going on, and ask them what you're supposed to do. I guarantee you, if you drive any further than a few hundred feet with those flashing red lights on, it's going to get somebody's attention, isn't it? That, that's, a, that's a great thing. Because if someone were to get on your bus, like Mr. Dyke that we saw, and maybe take a hostage, you can simply push that button and have those red lights going and drive along. Somebody's going to know about it. Somebody's going to call, call 911 after they posted it on uh, residents of Centerville and Ken Island Passing. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to end up there first. <laughs> and then about 600 comments later, someone will actually go, well, maybe there's a problem on the bus. <laughs> Don't get me started, folks. So yeah, that's a great, that's a great thing. Okay. That's not, that's unusual to us, isn't it? We don't yeah. normally see a school bus going down Route 50 or 213 for miles and miles and miles with those red flashing lights on. Unless Mr. Jack's driving. Escaping from danger is your number one goal. As a last resort, you might be forced to defend your life or the life of another. You gotta make sure that you're prepared, that you're mentally and physically prepared to engage an assailant. I've thrown up a couple things here and I'm gonna give you that you could possibly use that's on your school bus that you could use uh, as a weapon or something that you could use to defend yourself or even as a distraction to give you time to do something else. Uh, the big first aid kits that you have there, handbags, book bags. If you've got that broom, maybe a metal dust pan. Um, a fire you extinguisher. Fire extinguisher. Yep. Yeah, There's a belt, yep, belt with a belt buckle. Ice scraper or squeegee, right? Nice wooden handle, plastic handle, metal handle, whatever. Crowbar, uh, waste basket, nice heavy waste basket like that. I'm sure if you needed to use that, you could use that. So Jack, got your ice scraper on there. Yep, there you go. absolutely. And they're all reasonable things to have on a school bus, are they not? Yep. They're a wheel knocker. No, yep. that's all blocked. What is the wheel knocker? Oh, 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 yeah. That's, that's, a, that's actually a great thing because if and I tell I do these presentations for um, other organizations that work in finances. If some, your natural reaction when someone throws something to you is to turn. Imagine if something's going on and that attacker maybe on the bus or, or maybe as they get on the bus stop or the bus is already stopped and they're walking towards you and they're trying to put a magazine into a firearm. If you had a handful of coins and you grab those handful of coins and you threw them at their face, what's your natural reaction? Yeah, yeah. You're, it's called a sympathetic reflex, right? You're holding something in your hands, and I've seen it happen in, in gunfights. Your natural reaction is to do this and open your hands. So you may actually drop that weapon as you go to do this and you're turning to the side because those coins are starting to hit you in the face. That may be enough time for you also to take a few steps forward and wrap that person up and, and hold them on the ground, okay? These are just suggestions. These are just things that I'm putting out there. I'm not gonna be with you. My hands will not be on the wheel of that school bus. It's gonna be up to you. It's gonna be up to you to be prepared. Body's gonna go through a lot of different uh, things in a critical incident, in an emergency response, that fight or flight's gonna kick in. Heart rate's gonna go up, rapid breathing, blood pressure, muscles tight, tightness and check, trembling, all kinds of things are gonna go on. Someone jumps out and startles you, you grab your chest and you feel, oh my God, my heart's beating down on my chest, right? You can't stop that from happening. Your body's an amazing machine and it's going to go through those changes. 
But what I can tell you, and I've been in a couple critical incidents over 27 years in law enforcement and four years in the military, uh, you can control it. As soon as it happens, you can begin to control it. And the quicker that you can control it, the better you're going to be at staying in the game. There's something that the military uses, the Navy SEALs use, it's called box breathing. When you find yourself in a critical incident, it could be that you fell down the steps, you fell off a bike, you were in a minor traffic accident, someone jumps out and scares you, or a critical attack, you can do what's called box breathing. What box breathing is, is you draw an imaginary box in your mind. Every time you inhale, you draw a line across the top, exhale, line down the side, inhale as deep as you can, exhale as deep as you can. And you continue to draw that box in your mind and you'll be surprised how quickly you can return your body to a normal state. Give it a try sometime and let me know next time you see me at work. All right, this is the video that I showed you last year. This is a reenactment. I'm not judging, okay? I don't know what everybody in here would do in these situations. You have to ask yourself, this is a great opportunity. It's easy for us to look at this video, and the first one's kind of funny, not really, but kind of. We have to put ourselves behind the wheel of this bus when this uh, actor, this assailant, begins to do what he's going to do. This is an opportunity for us to learn and start to think about and prepare what we're going to do if we're in the same situation. Turn the lights off in the back, please. The kid's kind of standing off there on his own, right? I'm sure that helps. Remember, this is just a reenactment. These are all actors. I've been in a few 
few critical incidents in my life, and I've been around some people that have been highly trained, and I've been at times surprised or shocked even at the way that they have responded or maybe failed to respond. Um, and that's okay, you know, we, we have to train and, and prepare ourselves and practice and, and things like that. What I would ask you all to do is, you saw a couple different examples on things that you could do to throw that person off balance or to you know, help subdue them. Uh, just start to think about, in your preparation, what it is that you would do in those types of scenarios, in those types of situations that might help you and, and those people that are on that bus survive, okay? Um, any questions at this point? Questions, comments, or anything like that that you guys want to share? Well, I appreciate it. Before you go, um, talk, I just found this video last night, and i got to share it with you. Um, I talk about, this is my closing, be aware of your environment, be aware of your surroundings. Yeah, this is actually a gigantic manatee down in Florida. But as far as I'm concerned, and if I was on the beach, it would be like a 30-foot great white shark. And that's what I'd be screaming to freak my kids out. Um, but just look at the reactions of people and how close this thing gets to them before they actually respond or react to it, okay? Lights one more time, please. I think it's pretty funny. I mean, it's like ready to bite your ankle. Well, they're drinking beer. Yeah. And he's just kind of barely, they're like barely moves. That looks like a killer whale to me. I don't care what it like <laughs> But she finally figures it out. Yep, that's that. Those are your kids. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. This is tested at all. This, this first gal here, she she has some run high fight full effect. <laughs> That would have been me. That would have been me. I'm not going to wait to see what size Tifa that is. No, no. I'm not swimming with anything that looks like a shark. All right. What was most fascinating when I watched that video and just added it yesterday was the fact that uh, I found myself not as impressed with how they reacted to the danger around them. Uh, but I was more focused on the fact that none of them spilled their drinks. Thank <laughs> <laughs> very much. Appreciate you. Have a safe school year. All right? Very good.